So we're going to look at, for a little bit, the elastic curve and beam deflection. So basically the idea is, is we're wanting to limit how much a beam deflects because if you've got like concrete or plaster or something like that attached to it, then if you've got the beam that's deflecting too much, then it's going to crack. So it helps to be able to sketch the elastic curve. Okay. So to do that, we're going to start by just drawing a beam diagram, and then we have to draw the um, moment, the shear, and the moment diagrams to go along with it. So let me give you an example of what that would look like. So let's say we had ourselves a beam that was pinned on the right and had a, a fixed support in the center, and um, or just like a, a normal support in the center. So actually, I'm just going to draw the moment diagram. We don't actually need the shear. Um, so the moment is going to look something like this and then it's going to max out here so it's going to have its its maximum points where interesting things happen um so it's going to kind of shoops we'll pretend that was there and then um because it's going to bend around that point and then to dupes and then to dupes okay so this is the um the moment diagram so now if we want to figure out how this is going to deflect um then that would be the well the next thing that we're going to draw. So to kind of sketch the deflection curve, um, I guess one thing that you would need to note is that there's not going to be any deflection where it's pinned, and then you need to find the places where you have um, negative area and um, positive area because that will give you the kind of the directions of the curves of your um, integral. And um, then you want to actually identify the inflection points. Okay, so um, basically looking at this, we have, um, this is negative area, so that's going to be our frowny face, and this is positive area, so that's going to be our happy face, our upward curve. So um, there's no deflection where it's pinned, so that has to stay still. Now there's going to be some deflection because if you think about it, like right here, if you're just pushing on it, clearly it's going to go down. So we've got some delta A that it's going to start off at. And again, what we're basically doing is we're taking visually um, the integral of, uh, this is the deflection, deflection, as we're taking the, um, yeah, we're taking the integral. So um, this is going to come up to here, and then it's going to kind of come down to here. So this point, these points here kind of line up. That was supposed to go through there. <laughs> Still doesn't. Okay, so this point here lines up with this, and then this is your inflection point, okay, where it goes from being um, sad face so this is sad face and then happy face that is like the absolute crookedest line i think i've ever drawn so sad face happy face okay so that's your um inflection or that's your your curve so you've got the inflection point right here um, your inflection point of your deflection curve. Um, so we're uh, labeling these as the delta A. Um, and then over here is going to be our um, delta E. Like that. There we go. I don't know why I said delta E. I meant to say delta B. Okay, delta B. Okay, so this is just some unknown. These are... Um, conditions that we would need to find. Okay, so right now what we're trying to do is just get a general idea. Um, at some point we would need real numbers to get our max deflections because that's what the delta A would represent, what the delta B would represent. So like it should make sense that we're not going to have any deflection where it's supported, okay, and then uh, we're going to have the max deflections uh, in a case like this, where the um, external pressures or external forces are being applied, so like here and here, so we would like specifically go in and we need to do a delta A or uh, you know, it's air into the curve, um, delta B, and those would be the um, maximum deflections that we would be paying attention to. All right, so right now I'm not doing anything with numbers. I'm just trying to get you to kind of wrap your head around the concept. So let's look at like kind of another beam and see if we can draw a similar picture. 
So if we've got a beam that looks kind of like this, now we're going to have our reaction moments. So there's going to be a upward reaction, uh, a reaction force, and a uh, reaction moment that holds it on. Um, there could be a normal, but there's no normal in this case. So um, if we were going to do all the math and figure this out, we would end up with a um, moment curve that's going to start down here at the P. It's going to kind of go to there, and then it's going to kind of go straight across and then pop back down. So we're going to look at something like this, okay? And like that. That would be our moment curve. So now if we were going to draw our deflection curve, um, we notice that things don't move where they're pinned. So it's stuck on the end and it's free everywhere else. So everywhere else can be moved. So this is your frowny face and then this is your inflection point here where it goes from happy to sad or sad to happy. So we'll pretend that happens somewhere around here. And then this is where it's happy and uh, it's happy through out basically and then it's going to be straight um, so it's going to go to sad curve happy curve to a straight line so we've got sad curve so that's a frowny face um happy curve zoop <laughs> that's silly happy curve zoop and then a straight line up to somewhere zoop Okay, so that's what that curve is going to kind of look like. This is a super ugly curve. But again, um, this is going to be some kind of, I'm just going to call it delta D. Um, I don't know why I skipped C. Delta C, some kind of a max deflection that happens this direction, and then some kind of max deflection that happens in the other direction. So again, um, we're going to see a lot of deflections that are happening around the points that are um, being these external forces, but you're never going to see a deflection where you have something held on. Okay, so um, that's a little weird, but but let's just let's just do some more because we might as well. Okay, so now if you've got this curve, I'm just going to kind of draw stoop. And if you've got a curve, a deflection curve that kind of looks like this, um, these are going to have some kind of random centers. Um, if it's going up, we consider that as having a positive radius of curvature. And if it's going down, if the center is down here, um, this is going to have a negative radius of curvature. Um, so uh, how, how's another way to say this? Okay, so this is going to be our radius of curvature. But it's funny because even though we call that the radius of curvature, we actually call um, the inverse of that the curvature. <laughs> okay, so one over the radius of curvature is actually the curvature. All right, and we have a thing that we can do with math that I'm not going to do. And I know you're super sad because you come here to do math. Um, but we've got math here. And um, essentially what we can end up proving is that the curvature is going to be equal to m over e i okay and so the m is going to be the moment at that point the e is going to be the modulus of elasticity and i is going to be i about the neutral axis okay so that's one way to look at getting the uh the slope or the the, the curvature okay now where this gets fun and where we actually get to do a lot of math is to take this and put it together with something that we did in um, dynamics or maybe calculus two somewhere. So we had somewhere along the way, we learned that um, the curvature of something was equal to this crazy, if we had a curve defined by um, V of X, then we could take the DDV, DV DX, square it, go to the three halves power and go over the absolute value of d squared v dx squared. Um, this is actually something that you should know this already kind of thing, which is super weird. But essentially what I want to do is I want to take this definition and this definition um, and uh, <laughs> I want to take those two definitions together and, and pull them, uh, yeah, put them together. Now it's important that you notice that this is called, this v is, um, so this is the v would be the deflection. So this is the, the deflection curve 
the deflection curve function, I guess, but not shear. Okay, that's not the same um, V. <laughs> it's just the V that is reflecting the deflection curve. So clearly um, V is going to be hard to define or hard to find. Um, so we're going to kind of put all this together. So you end up with something that looks like this. Now, what's funny is at some point we go, um, if I was just going to do this, the math would just be overwhelming. So we're just going to simplify. And this is, and, and it's funny because it's one of those things where it's like you make all these assumptions and you get an answer of 5.0003. And if you put all the assumptions back in, you get 5.0003.0002 or something like that. So we are actually able to do this um, pretty easily. But basically what we're just going to do is we're going to say, okay, this dv, d squared dv, dx squared, and we're just going to straight up make that equal to um, the m over the EI. So essentially we're going to assume that this is close to 1, um, which again is something that you can look into and you can play around with it. It just depends on how much you want to get into it. Um, but in any case, we're going to pretend that that is basically 1 and just pay attention to what's going on with the second derivative with respect to x. Um, and so what we're able to do is we're able to get an equation for the moment that is um, based on EI times the second derivative of the deflection curve. Okay, so now there's more that we can do. Um, we know that um, shear is equal to d moment dx. So, and we know that um, the distributed load is equal to d shear dx. So this is distributed load and of course V is, this capital V is shear. So what we're able to do then is say, okay, so that means if V is dm dx, then it could be d dx of e i d squared v dx squared. And we're going to assume that e and i are constant. So <laughs> e and i are constant. So that means that we've got that the shear is equal to d e i d cubed uh, deflection dx cubed. And then similarly, we can do the same thing with the distributed load. And we've got that the distributed load is e i d to the fourth um, deflection dx to the fourth. And if that doesn't like get you super excited about life, I don't know what it is going to achieve that goal. So um, basically we have that one and then we can of course add in, this one probably should be written first. But So all of these now work. So we have this uh, crazy set of equations that will um, relate everything. So we want to use these, um, <laughs> yeah we're going to use these. Um, the hardest part, believe it or not, is not doing this. The hardest part is getting this silly boundary uh, values. So, so essentially, because um, when you're taking integrals of these to get the deflection curve, you're going to need initial conditions. So to get these initial conditions, um, it's best to use them at first where the beam is fixed because that's where you know the deflection is zero and you can use those to get the initial conditions. Um, another thing that you can kind of use is you can um, approximately um, you know, guess at the idea that, okay, you've got a dv over um, dx. So you can say, well, the tangent of theta is approximately dv over dx, except if tangent is really, really, really small, then you can say that theta is just directly dv dx. So you can use the v equals zero to get your first set of initial conditions, and then you can use um, theta is approximately dv dx to get the second set of initial conditions. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the initial conditions on that right quick. So the main ones we're going to look looking at are rollers, uh, pin, and fixed. Now rollers and pins are both going to be the same and um, you'll be able to say, okay, well I know that the deflection at that point is definitely zero. Um, getting the d theta, d, or the, the theta is different though. So um, on the fixed, you can say that the deflection is zero, but also that the dv dx 
has to be zero because it it's not just because like this can have an immediate um, rotation and this one can immediately go uh, and rotate as well. This one has to fight that reaction moment right there that's keeping it together. So it actually has that second one built in. Okay, so at, so we can kind of say theta equals zero. So we've got this initial condition for fixed um, there. Now, another thing that we have to remember, so after we get the initial conditions, we also need to remember that V has to be continuous. Because you can't have like a beam that goes curvy, 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 oh, under curvy, curvy. Like the beam sticks together. <laughs> the beam is, is together. So that means that if you've got like some kind of a beam here and you're looking at this thing at point A, you might have two different equations for um, the deflection because it's going to be like a piecewise function, right? Your deflection isn't just like... I mean, I guess it could be, but it's probably pretty likely that it's going to be a piecewise function. So um, in order to, so the bar cannot instantaneously change positions. So that means if we're doing dv1 dx at a, then that has to equal dv2 dx at a. So I guess another way, well, I guess what continuous means is that the, um, limit as we approach from either side is the is equal um, but I think this way makes a little bit more sense um, so that you'll get so you can kind of use how shall I say this once you kind of have one part working then you can use the one part working to get to the next part by saying okay well I can get that extra initial condition that I need by noting that these um, functions have to be continuous and now at this point it's just solving single order differential equations. So ba basically what you're going to do is you are going to work these problems out where um, you're going to get um, some kind of a um, function for a moment. So, you know, if you had, I don't know how to describe it, you're just going to have to figure out like whatever's going on with your beam if there's a, a force here and then you've got to come up with what the moments are, you have to come up with how this, um, you know, how this function would look like as you're going out with respect to X. So it, it gets pretty complicated, but you're going to kind of come up with a, um, an equation and then you're going to take this E I D squared V D X squared and apply it to M. Um, you're going to have to do integrate, and then you're going to integrate again, and then you're going to have to apply your initial conditions. So it'll either be these initial conditions here. Well, will, will be definitely these initial conditions here, but you'll need two sets. So um, usually what you'll either do is you'll go to, um, to use this fixed one here, or you'll use the continuity, and that will help you get the rest of your initial conditions. And then really it's just a, like I said, it's just a second order um, ODE that you need to solve from.